Hello, everybody. Um, you know, good to see everybody here. This is the leading industry practices for different investment strategies, blockchain, digital assets, and Outlook 2024. So we're going to be discussing a few things. One, the importance of institutional-grade infrastructure, as well as some of the uh, emerging, emerging trends that we're seeing um, in institutional man, demand. I'm sorry. Um, again, I'm Dan Husher. I'm the Chief Data Product Officer at uh, uh, Luca. I have the honor to moderate this panel of, uh, of, of, of very, uh, a very in impressive uh, a panelist collection here, and I think it'll be very informative for the, uh, for the audience here. Um, really quickly, we're joined by Michael from uh, Foundry. We're joined from Bennett, who's the National Leader of Blockchain and Digital Assets Center of Excellence, RSM. Matthew Siegel, Head of Digital Asset Research, Vanek. And we have Greg Scanlon, who's the managing principal at Franklin Templeton um, Ventures. Um, gentlemen, why don't we go around and just briefly introduce yourself um, and in your organizations. We'll start here with you, Mike. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Uh, boy, that last panel was depressing, wasn't it? <laughs> I, I think, although, you know, I, people ask me what I do. I'm like, I spend my life building out the future financial world, right? Like the system that we're going to use in the future. Um, so my name is Mike Collier. I'm the CEO of Foundry. We are focused on decentralized infrastructure, which is both the mining side and the staking side. And we are at the heart of, of uh, Bitcoin mining. Uh, as 30% of all Bitcoin mined every day flows through our software, our pool, and we're connected to all the customers uh, in North America that are in mining. Hello, everyone. So uh, Bennett Moore, part of RSM US. Uh, we're the fifth largest accounting consulting firm. So I lead up our Blockchain Digital Assets Center of Excellence. Really what that means is instead of maybe focusing on building the future, my focus is on ensuring that there's appropriate risk management, auditing capabilities, and transparency associated with the Blockchain Digital Assets space so that we can all feel comfortable you know, investing and getting involved with participating in this technology. So my team is really focused on supporting all of our traditional engagement teams across audit, tax, and consulting in serving blockchain digital asset clients. So thanks for the time today. Hey, everyone. I'm Matthew Siegel, run crypto research at, at Van Eck. Uh, I started my career as a journalist at, at Bloomberg and CNBC, got familiar with fake news, uh, then went on to manage equities. I worked for Kathy Wood uh, for four years during the uh, Alliance Bernstein days, pre-ARC, covering Web2. Um, so observed the growth of a lot of these natural monopolies and found myself asking the question, what's going to disrupt them? It's either going to be something on the regulation or something on the technology side. So when Bitcoin came around, I got uh, strong conviction in that and got to know Jan Van Eck, uh, CEO of Van Eck, uh, who uh, really made its original mark in gold and gold mining stocks. So we have a, a, we're a macro thematic shop. We look to get ahead of investment trends and then build products, intelligently designed products for investors. So joined Van Eck to try to build out our suite of crypto products. And I manage one of our uh, liquid token funds. Thanks, Dan. It's great to be here. I'm Greg Scanlon. I work for Franklin Templeton. Uh, I am a part of the venture capital team. I also enjoyed that that last talk. I come from a background of about 20 years in TradFi, long short equity hedge fund. So I've been listening to Peter Bookvar uh, for my entire career. So that was fun. Um, and so I came from long short equity hedge funds, trading, risk management, mix of fundamentals and quant. I got into blockchain uh, running validators, um, trying to be like Michael down there, um, ruling the Bitcoin mining and uh, Solana mining world. Um, and so at Franklin Templeton, um, we have an entire digital asset unit. Um, the Venture Capital Fund is just one part of that. And so I'll talk about it a bit more in a few minutes. But we've got a digital asset infrastructure unit. We've got nodes as a service. Uh, we've got the Venture Capital Fund focused on leading technologies. And we've got the uh, liquid token uh, investment strategy team focused on tokenomics and quantitative strategies within tokens. Great, thank you. Um, just the, the the word came up a couple times in the introduction, just for the benefit of maybe those that, that may not be as familiar with digital assets or crypto. Um, Mike, we'll, we'll start with you with some of the um, you know, infrastructure. Can you explain what mining is, staking and securing the network, just top level? Uh, no, no, <laughs> we don't have enough time. So, uh, look, at, I went down the uh, Bitcoin rabbit hole about six and a half years ago. 
and it reminded me of the start of the internet. So I was in college back in the early 90s when the internet came out, and I realized that this tech solves problems that can't be solved any other way. And it really is about having the ability to transfer value electronically without any middlemen. And that concept really didn't exist before the Bitcoin white paper. And the Bitcoin white paper laid out a set of rules, basically, by which everybody that participates in the ecosystem agrees to. And uh, one of the things I love about Bitcoin is the fact that uh, you, have to, you have to opt into it, right? So most of the people here probably aren't opted into the Bitcoin mining or Bitcoin today. Someday they will. Uh, but you have to opt in. And really, the only way to opt in is um, doing your own research. So you have to spend the time to learn how it works. And when you start talking about the security layer of Bitcoin, there are multiple layers to the security, and one of which is Bitcoin mining. So people say, ah, oh, Bitcoin, it's, you, know, you just got to believe in it. It's not what's it really backed by. It's backed by 4 million plus machines spread out throughout the entire world, about 12 gigawatts worth of electricity over... Uh, $20 billion invested in mining. Uh, it's an enormous, enormous industry, and uh, it's continuing to evolve. Um, so the miners basically, the machines run an algorithm, and I like to, in layman's terms, say they secure the network. Same thing on the nodes. You run a node in the cloud, and the you stake your, your token on that node and you get paid for that for staking your token and that's the simplest way of thinking about it um, big industry today there's 20 plus publicly traded miners uh, I don't know they represent eight eight billion dollars worth of uh, market cap um, and it's we're just getting started right so four years ago if you got into mining if you spent five million dollars you were one of the biggest miners in the world this last cycle, we spent $500 million to be a big miner. In this next cycle, it's going to be um, probably starting with a B. And, and where are we right now in the cycle? So obviously, we've seen Bitcoin go up to 70000 It went back down to, what, 14000 15000 Now we're back. Good scene about 35000 yeah, I don't. Where do we sit today? It's tough to be in this industry and watch the price every day, right? Because <laughs> it is True. up and down, up and down. Um, Bitcoin mining is a four-year cycle. Um, I think of of Bitcoin as a commodity. There's good times to invest and bad times to invest. Um, we are at the beginning of the next four-year cycle. So it, um, the halving is 170 days away, um, where today, you know, every 10 minutes, 6.25 Bitcoins introduced to the world. That's about a 1.8% inflation rate. That's about 900 Bitcoin a day. That's it. There's 900 new Bitcoin every day produced. And at the end of April, it's going to be cut to 450 Bitcoin a day. And the cycle will repeat every four years. Um, and those rules are programmed in. They can't be changed. There's no, like, secret committee that's deciding what we're going to, how much oil we're going to produce next month. Um, it's already, it's all laid out. It's, it's an open system, and we all agree to the rules. Um, so we're at the beginning of the cycle. And this is the best time to invest. Okay. And you mentioned there's 20 public Bitcoin miners, right? Like, what's the correlation between Bitcoin and you know the, the equity performance of those miners? They're mining the cycle and and Bitcoin price more more generally. Yeah. So today, people I think use Bitcoin miners as a proxy to Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, that will probably change as we get an ETF. Um, but I think of Bitcoin miners just like gold miners, right? Like. Why do you buy gold miners? Um, I think Bitcoin mining over the long term becomes a very boring industry. You expect a certain rate of return on a Bitcoin miner. Um, and, uh, and I think that's going to happen over the next kind of four years as, as this industry matures.
I'm going to jump in on that one. Like in the last cycle, six months before the halving, there were two publicly traded Bitcoin miners, and now there's 14 in, in the U.S. at least. And the the complexion of their balance sheets is completely different, right? Most of them went bankrupt, had too much debt, and had to restructure and have emerged from bankruptcy. But they have a, a wide dispersion in their in the amount of debt they have. And if you look at what stocks have performed this year, it's been the good balance sheet. Bitcoin miners, right? Because come March, when that halving happens, a lot of the industry will not be making money. And if you're stuck with this large debt servicing, uh, you, you might be struggling. So like, that's kind of how we're looking at it is at this point in the cycle, it's the, it's the beginning of the bull market. Next year should be better. But since you never know for sure, the best re risk reward is to stick the ones that don't have any debt, right? That was the whole problem with all the bankruptcies of 2022 was you don't borrow against your Bitcoin. That's how you go bankrupt. Appreciate that. Um, Bennett, um, we're, when we're thinking about the institutions that are, are either assessing getting into this or, or in the early stage of, of, of thinking about it, tell us a little bit about you know, what people can expect. What should they be looking at? I mean, there's, there's a lot of similarities, but there, there's a lot of new risks that come with this space that, that maybe you know, traditional financial participants may not be familiar with. Kind of give yeah. us a, I know it's a a it's deep a, topic, and it could probably could, go on for a while. We could spend but. multiple panels talking <laughs> right. about this topic, but I'll try to keep it succinct and high level, and it won't go into any like the very technical details of each nuanced area. But I think what I'll first start by saying is, you know, I'm not necessarily here to talk about the investment strategy side. I'll leave that to, to these two guys over here. But really, looking at it from the perspective of an operational lens, I'm looking at it from a perspective of four different key areas. So the first thing that I like to talk to people about when it comes to investing in digital assets or in blockchain technologies understanding some of the differences and the risks that are present within the custody approach to digital assets, right? So, you know, generally speaking, depending upon the different strategies a fund may have, you have different types of custody arrangements they might require. And this is starting to change uh, very rapidly toward you know, a model where you can use a fully outsourced custodian that handles all of your crypto, but we're not quite there yet for all types of different fund strategies. So. The first one is that you know fully outsourced custodian where they handle the keys completely, right? That's the more traditional model we're used to. The second level is more of this shared operational custodian model, where basically with private keys, with managing custody of crypto, you can actually have multiple parties hold a piece of the key, and you hold a piece of the key. And this helps in that they can help you operationalize and broadcast transactions, and usually give you exposure to some of the more cutting edge tech if you're looking at more of the VC side of the investment in this space. Uh, and they also have a lot of built-in technology level controls that businesses can use. And that third tier is kind of the self-custody layer, where if you're really working with some of the most cutting edge companies in the digital asset space, you might be stuck dealing with. So it's important to understand kind of those three layers. And when we think about kind of what we would expect as auditors looking at an entity who's investing in digital assets to have covered from a control perspective, you know, this has only been further compounded by all the recent activities surrounding FTX, Celsius, Voyager, BlockFi, all, all the big names that we've heard about that kind of went down the last two years, is, is really focused on four key control areas. This is really, you know, how do you get comfort over how the keys were generated and created? How do you get comfortable over the access management? You know, is there segregation of duties in place in terms of who can go and access these? Or is there one single founder that can actually just move everything if they just so choose? Right. Uh, then you've got the physical and virtual security layer, more segregation of duties at that level. And then lastly, the incident response disaster recovery piece. Really important that companies test their ability to recover these funds. And when we look at this from a third party due diligence perspective, you know, this is also an important consideration to think about. If you are going to use you know, a fully outsourced custodian, you should be reviewing their SOC 2, SOC 1 reports. Does it have coverage of <clears throat> the key management components um, also, you know, if we look at kind of the insurance perspective from a due diligence side, there's a lot of very specific ex exclusions that exist for crypto when we think about, you know, ensuring custody of digital assets. So these are all really important things to keep in mind as you think about getting involved in this space. Understand how custody works or have a good CIO or CISO who understands this stuff well so you understand your risk and you can mitigate counterparty exposure. The only other thing I'd like to add to that before kind of moving on just to one other area around trading and accounting is, you know, we are seeing a lot of the more fully outsourced custodians in this space uh, begin to offer what I just frankly call counterparty protection against exchange trading. You know, a lot of them have different names for it, but it's very simply what many of us are used to in the traditional finance world where 
you know, historically, you had to deposit digital assets on an exchange to trade with them. Now, a lot of these large custodians are making collateral arrangements with the exchanges so that you can trade on the exchange platform with like for liquidity without ever leaving the secure bankruptcy remote custody environments of the fully outstored, uh, outsourced custodians. So just moving on to the last two pieces, which I would say is just kind of the trading considerations. I think the big thing to be aware of is just you know some of the more newer risks that are present in this space. We've seen a lot of these, uh, what we're calling forced API trade attacks, where you know basically API keys that are connected to exchanges or to OTCs that are being traded through are compromised. And you know non-liquid assets are being traded for that very highly liquid assets, resulting in some significant losses. So that's just one example of some of the more kind of nuanced risks that kind of exist in crypto. And then from the accounting side, you know, the most important thing when it comes to the accounting landscape of digital assets is, you know, do you have an accountant who understands crypto and is also a very good accountant who can apply existing guidance to this nascent and new cutting edge space, right? I highly recommend checking out the AICPA's Auditing and Accounting Guide for Digital Assets. Also, just on the trading side, AMA has a very good paper on digital assets trading, you know, cybersecurity controls and a number of other areas. And the last thing on the accounting side is just make sure you're getting good data and using good back office tools. You know, over the last few years, we've seen significant improvements in the back office side of digital asset accounting, you know, platforms such as Luca and a variety of others that are providing businesses with much better tooling to capture data surrounding digital assets because many of these exchanges or even the on-chain data uh, can get very complicated, even though it's as simple as you'd think is just querying and grabbing the data, it can get a lot more complex. So that was partially high level explanation, but uh, I'll leave no, it at that good. and happy to drill into more details if someone wants to approach me later. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Greg, I, I want to go over to you. Anything to add to that, but maybe from the founders or like, like an investment, like VC perspective, like what should they be thinking about? Yeah, I think even taking a, a step back from the VC perspective, when you look at what Franklin Templeton did strategically saying, okay, if we are going to be a leader in blockchain and we believe that this technology is going to become the back end rails for the financial system, uh, it's important that we understand this space entirely. And so what that means is, you know, a lot of today code is your counterparty risk as well as the company behind it, but in blockchain, Smart contract code is your counterparty risk. And so specifically what Franklin Templeton did, they said, we're going to create a unit. That unit's going to report directly to the CEO, akin on par to you know our traditional bond and equity and macro funds. Um, as well as that, we're going to actually build in the space. So digital infrastructure, that means we've got a team of dedicated engineers that are out there building smart contract code, understanding the cryptography so that we don't fall victim to these um, end of address attacks that we're seeing, or if we can at least be aware of them to make sure that we can avoid them. Um, two, making sure we run nodes as a service because that's a critical piece of the infrastructure, not only to support the ecosystem, but to understand what's actually going on on chain. Um, and all of this flows back to the investing side. So the venture team, we benefit from the engineers as well as the data, but we also at, we also act as a leading edge detector of where these technologies are moving, uh, what the latest advances in the space are, and relay that back to engineers as well as infrastructure. And the token team does the same, right? And so obviously token um, to a certain degree is, is a new uh, capital asset, asset, however you wanna frame it and value it, but it's something that needs to be respected and understood if you're gonna be working with the SEC, if you're gonna be trying to lead in the space to have things approved like our money market fund that's on chain and uses no traditional backend rails, you need to understand what it means uh, to run a smart contract, to be, have a validator run transactions uh, that you control that are from your clients through their machines, um, and if you're going to allow it to interact freely, um, which we are currently not allowed to for regulatory reasons right now, but you know, it's something that in the you know, let's call medium term future is is an exciting thing that we certainly think is the technology is there. It's it's a matter of institutions like Franklin Templeton working with regulatory um, bodies in order to get us there. Great. Um Matthew, for you, um, 
you know, the world is is much bigger than just Bitcoin. I think a lot of times people may use it synonymously with cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. It might be the first one they think about, but the world's much larger. Um, what are you seeing from an institutional uh, perspective around uh, investment strategies? Uh, it's it's very much a bifurcated world because the typical institutional buyer in the U.S. cannot really access crypto for their clients because of regulatory issues. And we've seen in the last, well, we've seen basically all year that most of the price performance in these tokens is coming during Asian trading hours. So let's go back to like, why are we here in the first place is to make money so that number goes up. And so we're trying to pick these new uh, assets that are going to go up the most. Uh, and why are they going to go up? Uh, it's, it goes back to the conversation in the last panel. Um, the, the TLT long bond ETF is now down more peak to trough uh, than Bitcoin, right? Global ag bond index has a negative return over five years. So there may be this dollar milkshake theory that's happening in the developed world among the U.S. and its allies. But there's an increasing part of the world that you know, object to what we are printing our dollars to spend. Um, and that is the part of the world that's adopting this technology. And that's frankly where, you know, you can see a lot of the flows coming from, you know, family offices outside of the U.S. And the, the, the point of the technology is to hold your own keys so that you don't have to rely on all of these intermediaries to hold value for you. Uh, and you know, we as investors are trying to get ahead of that curve and say, OK, this is the way the world's going to be in 20 years or in how many ever years. And since we're all on a different path demographically and some of us are, ch are saving for our kids, then it would make sense, OK, well, let's buy some of these tokens and have a regulated custodian hold them on behalf of us. And, and that's kind of what we're doing at, at Van Eck. But um, the point is really to identify, like, which are these decentralized networks that are going to gain adoption globally as an alternative to the U.S. dollar, frankly. Uh, and our job as an investment analyst is to try to handicap which of those networks have the best chance of intermediating the most amount of value and capturing some stream of income that goes back to the token holder itself. And then uh, personally, I'm managing a fund of, of you know, 15 or so of these call options that I think have the best chance of capturing uh, the lion's share of the value. So the, the clients that we have are, are typically more on the family office and endowment side, but as the Bitcoin ETF, uh, hopefully uh, as a, some number of them launch uh, by Q1 of next year, some of the polling that we're seeing indicates some considerable investor appetite. And if you look at the European and Canadian Bitcoin ETNs, they've had about $600 million worth of inflows in the last month. The, the entire year to date number is like 800 million. So that's three quarters of all flows coming in the last few weeks from investors looking to front run what we hope is, you know, this new uh, new buyer, which is RIA's wirehouses, who will finally be able to at least buy Bitcoin, which should be custodied by one of the, you know, major service providers. In, in some of your previous life, you mentioned kind of covering the Web 2.0 companies. In terms of research, traditional finance versus maybe some of the research that you're doing in digital assets, you know, what are some of the similarities? What's different? Kind of, what does it look there? Crypto is a is a very participatory asset, so the governance is happening uh, on Twitter and in Reddit forums. Um, there's no broker delivering you your morning call with your upgrades and downgrades and choice of corporate access. So it's very much a like even as an asset manager, you have to bootstrap your own network, which is why we st like. When when Jan got conviction on Bitcoin in 2017 and the regulator didn't let him set up an ETF, he started, well, he bought Bitcoin, but he started writing checks into venture so that we would have relationships and a network. These are all essentially early stage venture if they happen to be liquid tokens or illiquid venture. So that formed our network. And then we launched these uh, private funds once we got a little smarter uh, in the space. But it's it's very different. Uh, there's a lot more imagination and uh, kind of do your own research involved. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit about uh, you know institutional demand. And this this came up on um, actually the panel that I was on previously around kind of the institutionalization of this 
of this marketplace. So from an institutional perspective, we'll just go down the line. We'll start here with uh, Mike with you. What are you seeing in terms of uh, institutional adoption? You know, when we started Foundry four years ago, the, the idea was institutional money is coming into crypto and institutional money is going to come into Bitcoin mining. And we, we said, let's build a business. Let's think in terms of decades. Um, not really worried about what's going to happen this month, next month. And we laid out a premise of like, at some point, nation states, energy companies are going to be mining Bitcoin, right? And we kind of wrote this down. And, and four years later, we actually have some experiments happening at nation states, small. But the energy companies are here. Like, make no mistake about it. The biggest energy companies in the world have been running experiments around Bitcoin mining over the last 12 to 18 months. We take their phone calls. We, we work with them. We help them navigate this space. They see the opportunity. I actually think from a, from a Bitcoin mining perspective, it's probably one of the greatest invention, inventions for our electrical grid in the last, I don't know, 60, 70, 80 years. This idea of a controllable, an intermittent controllable load on the grid is a really powerful concept. I heard all morning about talking about ESG and we're, oh, we need more you know, renewable power. Those are intermittent power sources. You have to balance the grid with an intermittent power demand. And I don't want to turn my air conditioning off. I don't want to turn my lights off. So when you have a willing participant like a Bitcoin miner who in a flip of a switch can turn off their machines, that balances the grid. And, and those experiments are happening. A gigawatt worth of energy literally within 10 seconds shut off in Texas so they didn't have blackouts this summer. That's such a, it's a powerful concept. So when we talk about investing in Bitcoin mining, we're actually investing in our electrical grid. And I think that's a, a really powerful concept. I mean, it's more of an infrastructure play than anything else. Yeah, that's an interesting way to look at it. How about uh, Bennett, yourself? Yeah, I mean, coming back to the institutional demand side, I think a lot of it from our perspective comes back to what I was talking about from the risk management perspective. I think a lot of companies are focused on a flight to quality. You know, after FTX, after everything they saw, there's a lot more focus on ensuring companies have good controls in place and that, you know, there's appropriate segregation of duties and clear oversight and compliance considerations going in to affect with all these companies. And I also, you know, I'm starting to see a lot more experimentation with, you know, what I've always hoped for with this space, which is, you know, blockchain as a technology is just a new infrastructure layer. You know, I think, Matthew, you said it earlier, which is, you know, we're really just going to slowly start to see uh, a movement of maybe more traditional assets onto a blockchain-based architecture. You might call it crypto. We, we call these assets on top of blockchain crypto today. I prefer the term digital assets, but, you know, I, I think we're starting to see that even with the largest banks and institutions experimenting with putting all forms of different types of traditional assets on private blockchain-based architectures that they will likely eventually start to transition over to the public chain space. And so I'm very excited about the idea of bringing all different types of assets we currently work in today onto a more efficient architecture. Whether we call that crypto or digital assets, I think, is not really the point. It's more about where this architecture might take us and what benefits we might derive from it. Yeah, that, that's an exciting use case for sure. Um, Matthew, what are you seeing? Institutional demand. Yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure if banks are ever really going to be touching open source blockchains with any rigor. I mean, they really are the anti-bank kind of uh, um, thing. Uh, and, like, look at bank stocks. They're at an 80-year low right now versus the S&P, and they're not going down uh, without a fight. Like, you can see it with uh, Elizabeth Warren trying to get this uh, new measure into the National Defense Authorization Act, which is going to treat every Bitcoin miner and validator and wallet provider as if they're a financial institution and make them report on uh, information that they don't have, really, about their clients. So it's a there's still a lot TBD in terms of institutional demand in the U.S., and I'm, I'm not terribly optimistic that's going to change unless we had a major political event. But that's not necessarily true in other parts of the world, and I agree wholeheartedly about the energy story. Argentina's third largest oil and gas company is now reportedly mining crypto with their excess um, methane, and there's a 
political candidate who has a chance, very pro Bitcoin political candidate who has a chance to win for the presidency uh, in two weeks. So I think the institutional adoption really will be catalyzed by changes at the government level in nation states who have a problem with with the Fed money printer. Um, but and then separate from that is like, OK, will, you know, Citadel and Wellington buy Bitcoin ETF when it comes out? Well, like the polling is looking good, but uh, let's wait and see. Last but not least, Greg, what are you, what are you seeing? Yeah, so I agree that the public and private uh, debate is still out there. Um, I do think that we will see public architectures that have been created, leveraged by private banks, but probably, at least certainly in the near term, um, in the way that Matthew's referring to in terms of they're going to control whether it's an oracle or a validator set. Um, to make sure that all questions are answered and information is is tightly kept. And so I do think that um, it creates opportunity, at least out in the venture space that we look at, because even if this is a uh, an open source public architecture, there are ways for regulated entities to leverage it. Um, and uh, we are seeing, you know, not only American but European banks and in Asia, HKEX, um, they are interacting with the technology and the way that they're doing it is by swapping out their back ends for what distributed ledger technology is. Um, it's not, you know, really a an attempt to integrate necessarily, right? They're doing piecemeal byproduct. Um, we're just going to swap out the back end. And so I think that's a positive thing for the technology. Um, and I would say the other interesting dynamic that's playing out is on the, you know, the digital asset or crypto native side, we are seeing a realization of the necessity for regulation, KYC, AML, et cetera. And so whether it is, um, you know, Vitalik, who's a co-founder of Ethereum, one of his latest papers is all about basically how can we responsibly merge um, regulatory with open source um, distributed ledger technology in the form of blockchain. Um, you know, and, and that's, at least in my opinion, somewhat of a significant moment for crypto, you're also seeing um, major exchanges like Uniswap uh, and others start to integrate, you know, kind of KYC, AML optionality because the crypto digital asset native have come to realize that this is a necessary function and it will not only protect, you know, the common man, but it will protect them as well. There are some sacrifices that some people have to make, but um, overall it, it's, it's proved to uh, work for systems. And so um, you combine that with Bitcoin rally and, you know, what we focus on in terms of private markets, they've, they've certainly bottomed out in the last few months. And these stats point to, you know, generally you get 29 months worth of recession. We're in month number 30. And so uh, we expect for institutional investors like Franklin Templeton to continue to roll out more funds on chain, which would increase real world assets. We expect other banking participants um, and asset manager participants to do the same. Um, and at the same time, we expect more money in terms of investment to flow back in as asset prices rally um, and kind of the, the freeze of, of the crypto world thaws. Okay. And kind of more forward looking, um, what are you most excited about 2024 beyond? So I think, you know, the, the other somewhat institutional demand that we see on the ground is um, for small or medium-sized businesses who are willing to um, experiment, um, there are solutions in blockchain technology. Uh, most pressing is obviously cross-border payments and, and domestic payments, whether it's Latin America or Asia, um, where we're seeing companies that leverage APIs for fintechs, um, healthcare companies, uh, uh, outsourced um, engineering talent, we're seeing them have considerable traction and product market fit because you've completely obfuscated away all of the crypto dynamics, but you're, you're leveraging crypto on the back end to make instant transfers for, you know, a tenth of the price that they used to pay. Um, 
and uh, companies are, are thrilled to do this. There's, as long as the invoicing shows up correctly, um, there are no complaints whatsoever. Okay, great. Matt, what about yourself? What, what are you excited about beyond uh, 2024? Uh, well, I, ru I run a book which is benchmarked uh, to X Bitcoin. There's no Bitcoin in my benchmark, and I own a bunch of Bitcoin, and I'm excited about the halving. And I look back at previous cycles, and the Bitcoin dominance tends to rise into and after the halving. And then folks who've made money on Bitcoin basically take their profits and do more interesting stuff, maybe with leverage on chain into the long tail of, of speculative assets. But I, I think the ETFs are going to be a big deal. And uh, I'm kind of selling some of these altcoin rally and adding to the Bitcoin stack. Nice. Bennett, what about yourself? Yeah, so I'm going to talk about this maybe from a, an institutional perspective and you know maybe sure. an individual retail perspective. So from the retail level, I'd say some of the things that are exciting to me is some of the concepts of real world assets, like what Franklin Templeton is doing. I like the idea that as a retail individual, it, you can make it easier to invest in and get more involved in some of these more liquid asset classes that were historically more difficult to invest low dollar figures in. And then from the institutional side, I'd say it's a little bit more forward looking than just you know 2024 and beyond. This is probably 2028 and further beyond that I'm really looking at. But I view there as a lot of potential for the use of smart contracts and stable coins for business to business, as well as for all kinds of automation from the perspective of just streamlining different types of contractual arrangements we have. You know, that requires a lot of regulatory considerations. There needs to be regulations put in place surrounding the whole stablecoin architecture or the CBDC concepts. But I think there's a lot of potential for automation through the use of smart contracts with stablecoins. And, you know, going even further beyond that, you kind of get into the potential for a lot more streamlined automation of back office. I mean, coming from somebody as you know, an accountant, I don't view any role of the auditor or someone who's a trust writer disappearing, so I'll make that crystal clear. There's still subjective things that any business does, but for a lot of the you know, very basic types of things, like bank confirmations, for instance, I think blockchain has the potential that if you have both counterparties, like a client and your counterparty on a blockchain who's using stablecoins and you have the invoice that's uh, digitized, you have the supporting documentation such as authorizations, you have the journal entries and you have the value transfer that you can tie all into that one place and compare on both like both parties' financials in a secure but, you know, an, not anonymized but an encrypted way. That has a lot of potential to streamline things. And so I look forward to where that might take us one day. We're still a good ways away from that, but I view a lot of potential there. Yeah, I, I agree. I think you're 100% right. Mike, what about yourself? Yeah, I keep thinking about Matt's comment around the banks. Uh, we built Foundry up in Rochester, New York, which... For a lot of you in New York City, that's the other part of the state, closer to Buffalo. Uh, so I, I think of the banks that are they're going to have their Kodak moment, right? Where they got to decide whether they're going to reinvent themselves or they're going to die. And I don't know when that happens, but at some point, I think, uh, think that that's going to play out. In terms of the future, um, you know, at the last peak... Two years ago, Bitcoin traded close to 69,000. There was 150 exa hash that secured the network. And I've always been a big believer. I look at things from the Bitcoin mining perspective, but I've always been a big believer that you can only store so much value on chain based on how much security you have on that chain. And uh, today, since that point in time, th there has been almost a 3x increase in the security of the Bitcoin network. So two years ago, there was a trillion dollars stored on the Bitcoin network with 150 exahash. We are between 450 to 500 exahash today. So I think about where this goes in the future. The way I think about it is there's, there's the ability to store a lot more value on the Bitcoin network based on the security that's been invested. And we see in the next two years, we'll see another 10 to $20 billion that will go into the Bitcoin mining infrastructure to continue to strengthen the network. That's an impressive number. All right, we just got a couple minutes left here. Um, let's do kind of just a little something different. Let's do a little bit of rapid, uh, you know, rapid questions. One or two word answers, please. Um, I'd be a little bit remiss if we didn't bring up the uh, digital ass out outlook for 2024 and not talk about us. Spot Bitcoin ETF, which come up a couple times today, but um, Mike, we'll just start here. Probability that we get a uh, Bitcoin ETF? 
I was at a conference Friday. Everybody said it would happen in the next three months. I'm a firm believer that it's first quarter 2025. First quarter. Bennett? When, not if. When, not if. When, not if. Okay, by when? No? Okay. I'm not going to say. All right. Matthew, yourself? Yeah, 95% chance by Jan 10. By Jan 10. Okay, very specific. Good. Greg? Um, I also think it's when, not if, and I also think 2024, Q1. Yeah, okay, that would be mine as well. Um, <laughs> all right, and uh, feel free to pass on this if, if you don't feel comfortable putting out numbers there. But um, Bitcoin price, end of 2024. Higher, lower, flat? And if you care to actually give a price target, please do. Look at in the last six and a half years, it's been impossible. I, I spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week thinking about this industry. I have no ability to predict the Bitcoin price. I've been wrong every single time. I think there's going to be a lot more pain, especially for the miners as we head into the halving. And then fourth quarter next year, I think we're off to the races. And where it goes, I don't know. You're going to no pass. Idea. Okay. I'm going to recommend the inverse Kramer approach. Okay. <laughs> All right. well, you, you've put up price targets on other yeah, assets. Yeah, we have a 275K price target on Bitcoin, which equates to half the market cap of the above ground gold held for investment purposes. Uh, I think there's a better than 50-50% chance we get a new high Q4 after the election when typically uh -huh. there's relief rally among uh, all markets. Yeah. Is, is there a time constraint on that 275K? Uh, there's not, but I did say that to my boss that if Bitcoin doesn't make a new high by 2027, I will offer my resignation. Oh, okay. <laughs> high stakes. Greg, yourself? Um, so I do think by the end of 24, it will be higher. I think it, it'll go again back to um, a, a macroeconomic narrative will be in a declining rate cycle. Um, we'll see where inflation and growth are and where yield, real yields are, where equity valuations are. And it, it only improves, in my mind, the, um, the you better own it case for Bitcoin. Well, gentlemen, it's been uh, a pleasure to sit up here and moderate with you guys and, and meet some of you in, in person. So uh, thank you very much for taking the time today and joining us. I'm going to give everyone a, a round of applause.